Good morning, church. Good morning, newcombs. Is that Luke or uh, is it a new haircut? It is. Uh, so why don't we stand together? We're so glad that you guys are here. Uh, we want to welcome any new people in. Uh, we're so happy that you're here. There's a connection card on the back of the bulletin, and you can fill that out and drop it in our drop box in the hallway. Or you can scan the fancy QR code on the back. We would just love to get to know you and reach out to you, and we're so happy you're here. And a special, extra special morning welcome to everyone watching online today. We are so happy to spend part of your morning with you. Uh, so let's pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you so much. You are a great God, Lord. And we believe that your presence will be felt in this room this morning with us, and we are not alone today. We, Father, we just pray that our praise would be sufficient to you and that we would make your name great this morning, Father. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. That's your name. The mountains shake and cry. your name, the ocean's roar is today.
today. Um, I will excuse you to your seats. We're going to uh, do some things this morning. You all may be seated as well. I want to give you some announcements, things that are coming up, and then we're also going to take some moment, a few minutes to install our church board and pray for them. After that, kiddos, that's when we will send you to your spaces, but we're going to have you with us for about 10 more minutes. So we do want to let you know a few things that are coming up. Right after service today, our financial management class continues. We'd love for you to drop into the sessions that are helpful to you today. We're going to, uh, our teachers are going to talk about creating or keeping up with a spending plan or budget. One of my favorite things about having a budget is it allows you to budget in to treat yourself. So uh, I hope if that is an area where you would just love some encouragement or resources that you will uh, stop by the conference room after service, which is downstairs, and stay for, uh, for our one-hour class on that today. Um, also, this afternoon, we have the Ladies' Spring Tea um, that is going to be at Rebecca Borum's house. And so uh, many of you have signed up. If you haven't, we'd still love for you to come. Just make sure that before you leave, you get that address. You can um, stop by the lobby uh, after service, and we'll get that to you. May 6th is the men's ministry breakfast, and then May 13th is another event for men, which is the men's ministry golf event. Um, you can use the items in the bulletin to RSVP, or if you're online, you can go to our website, woodbridgenaz.com, um, and then on the homepage, scroll down to special events, click that event, and there'll be the ability to register there. And then June 2nd, we are starting to collect RSVPs for family night out. That just means our whole church family, people of all ages, are welcome to come for this night of baseball out. And uh, we're just working on collecting RSVPs and payments by May 14th. On June 4th, we're going to celebrate our students. We have uh, want to give special honor to those who are graduating from high school and above. And so please let us know about your graduate so we can be in contact. And then also on Student Sunday, we are, uh, Pastor Luke and I are working on some other plans to um, honor and appreciate all of our students of all ages. So today I do want us to uh, take some time to celebrate and install our church board. In the Church of the Nazarene, we believe in the priesthood of all believers. So everyone who follows Jesus 
is equipped and called to lead others to Christ, to use their gifts and talents for the kingdom of God. But God does call some into roles of leadership and responsibility and care, particularly over the church. And so today we celebrate that. So Right now, I'm going to call up just our newly incoming board members. So uh, we welcome Elizabeth Easterday. If you will, I'll meet you down here. Uh, Val May Oaksinen and Gary Newcomb. Would you uh, just show your gratitude for their bravery <laughs> in accepting the, your, your vote, your call to ministry? Um, we're going to have Pastor Narcisa and Pastor Luke read us a few Bible verses to commemorate this moment, and then we will bring up the, the um, additional board members, the reelected and incumbent board members. So um, we would love to hear first from you, Pastor Narcisa. Therefore, I, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Romans 12, 1 to 2. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Colossians 3, 16. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Galatians 6, 6. Thank you. So we come to this moment now where you stand before the altar. You stand before Christ as well as this congregation who has elected you. And you take upon yourself the task of caring for the affairs of this church. May you look to the assignments you now assume as special opportunities of service to the Lord. And may you find joy and spiritual blessing in your performance of your respective duties. Yours is no light task. <laughs> um, it is no light task, but the future of this church and the way that we love on our community and invite others in is entrusted with you and each of you are called and able to do it and I am blessed by your commitment and I know that this church will be blessed by your commitment. May God bless you, grant you wisdom and strength in this term of service. I would like to ask the rest of our board members, our midterm and re-elected board members to also come up and join them. Yeah, we'll have you just come up and fill in right next to them. Church board, you have been given a card on which is printed a covenant, and uh, we are going to read it in unison as a unified church board, um, and also including uh, Regina Signari, who's not able to be here today. Um, so let's read this together. In consideration of the confidence placed in me by the church being selected for the office I now assume, I hereby covenant to increasing my Christian maturity through spiritual disciplines, to pursuing a lifestyle of personal holiness, to the character traits and conduct of a church leader in the Church of the Nazarene, to spiritual leadership for the church and in its work in harmony with the pastors and staff, and to endeavor to lead the people of Jesus Christ and make Christ-like disciples who are real, relevant, and relationship. Okay, so now you all get to stand up. Now, you don't have to say these words if you don't believe them, but I want you to stand up and give you the opportunity. I'm going to ask for your help with something, and if you agree, please respond with we will. 
Will you pray for the leadership of this church that we may find unity in the calling of the Holy Spirit? Will you seek to support these elected leaders striving to be understanding of their problems and tolerant in the midst of seeming failures? Will you lend assistance joyfully when called upon so that as we work together, our church may be an effective instrument in winning the lost to Christ? Wonderful. Let's pray. Uh, board members, as you are able or called, I encourage you to kneel. And then friends, I would encourage you to come forward, lay hands on them, um, and let's bless them in this time. Good and holy God, we come before you with gratitude for these leaders that you have selected and called for this coming year. You heard our many months of prayer leading to this point, and what a blessing it is today to see it come to fruition. We ask, Lord, that you help each one of these leaders to serve faithfully. The burdens laid upon them are not light, and they will need your guidance. We ask for your protection of their well-being and over their families and households. We ask for clarity and unity in sensing the Holy Spirit. We ask for wisdom. God, please bless these leaders, bless our community, bless the growth of our church, both deep and wide. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 And with that, we will take our two minutes of greeting, and kids, you're dismissed to the back to meet with your leaders. Well, today as you make your way back to your seats, I want to tell you the story of a fire. It's a fire that has been burning in Pennsylvania since 1962. For over 60 years, the Centralia Mine Fire has been going. And I hear John knows about it, so let's talk after service. <laughs> I geeked out about it this week. Now, the origins of this underground fire, there's a, there's a pretty good theory as to how it started, but it's, it's not known 100%. But, the, but the, the thought is that it started back in 1962, May 27th, 1962, during a landfill trash burn. Now, 
Now that's pretty common. I guess in the 60s they burned a lot of trash too. But they were like, hey, our landfill's gotten a little too big. Let's burn it down. But what happened, was believed to happen, is that a underground mine under that spot caught fire. It was abandoned. It was left with lots of explosive, flammable materials inside, both through nature and perhaps other things that were left in there. And so what happened is that it started in this one area, but then it spread through a vast underground labyrinth of these connected, flammable tunnels. The fires started coming up to the surface around town. It was very mysterious at the time as to what could be happening. First, the locals worked at it, and the state, then the federal government. The danger to people and businesses was clear. The toxicity in the air was obvious. But eventually, after 16 years of fighting the fire, it was more efficient to relocate everyone out of Centralia and let the fire just keep going under the surface. It couldn't be totally put out. Now, I learned about the Centralia Mine Fire about 20 years ago. I was on a visit to Pennsylvania, and I didn't really think about it again until this week when I was preparing to talk about the danger of having too little anger. There's something about this burning under the surface <laughs> that works well here. Well, we're in week two of our Anger Danger series where we're working from the idea that we get into dangerous territory with anger when it's too fast, when it's too little and we repress it, or when it's too broad, when we're angry about everything or angry all of the time. Last week, we talked about slowing down our anger, what righteous anger looks like in comparison to fast anger. Today, we're looking at anger danger when we have too little of it. So for some of us, anger danger isn't about outward rage or flying off the handle. It's about the secret fire you don't know is there. Or it's the slow, under-the-surface burn that you do know about, but you keep it stuffed down. Now, too little anger can be caused by a variety of things, but here's just a few. One is helplessness. The, the problem is just too big to deal with, so I'll just move on and let it smolder. In Centralia, that's to really, really simplify things. That's basically what happened, right? People moved their lives elsewhere out of helplessness against this massive, massive problem. Sometimes what life throws at us is so big and bad that we feel too small to, to get angry or to stay angry about it. And that certainly can be a vital coping strategy. But it also can be an unhealthy or unhelpful thing that we do if we stay in helplessness beyond the time that we are actually helpless. The, the second way that, that we might be too little in our anger is, is out of denial. Well, the fire and smoke's right in front of me, but I'm pretending it doesn't exist. Now, in Centralia, most of the people moved, right? The government canceled their zip code <laughs> so to get people to move. And most of them did it. Most of them moved, but a handful stayed. First, it was about 50 people. Now, I think it's about 10 people that live there. They had a 90-year-old mayor at one point who just wouldn't go. Sometimes we have too little anger because we're denying the problem. It may be something very intimate, like a family member's overuse of alcohol. Or it may be something very widespread, like systematic racism. It's like under your street is on fire, and at any moment a dangerous gas may flare up. But let's just keep on mowing the grass and planting the flowers anyway. And a third possibility is apathy. Apathy would be this idea, I know there's a huge dangerous problem, but I'm not going to do anything about it. Apathy, or another word for this is indifference, it can stem from things like denial and helplessness or anxiety and fear. But apathy can also just be about deciding something just isn't worth it. It's too much to think about. It's too much to care about. Anger is warranted, yeah but I don't want to pry. I don't want to get involved. 
wonder if you see yourself in any of these three. For slow burn people, maybe we relate more to one of them or two of them or maybe all three of them. But I think even the quick burn folks, they don't get hot about everything. Even folks with big tempers, there are some things where they do the slow burn. They do the slow burn. Now, I'm sure we could come up with a bigger list here, but I want us to take these three ideas as we turn to our scripture passage today. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 25. And this passage is going to talk about anger directly, but it's also going to talk about some of the, the smoldering and slow burn that happens behind it. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down where you, while you are still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, so it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get all, rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving other, each other just as Christ God forgave you. So let's break this down. If we, if we go to verse 25 and the first part of 26, it tells us that we need to speak truth, not lies. We need to put off falsehood. Now, that probably seems like good living 101. That's not a surprise to anyone. But I think there's something interesting here that pokes at the reality of where we are today in anger danger. This idea of too little anger. Because people who struggle with the too little anger side of things may use white lies to mask their anger. Or they may kind of play nicey-nicey and, and put on a good extra smiley front to mask the true feelings and the anger or being upset. But friends, we need to speak up to speak truth. We can put on a falsehood in our silence just as much as we can put on a falsehood with white lies or other ways of speaking. Silence doesn't solve the things that makes us angry. It just shoves them down. So angry silence isn't a good habit. Playing nicey-nicey isn't a good habit, and raging at someone also is not a good habit, as we already know. So then what in the world are we supposed to do? Because it seems like I just took all the things off the table. Well, I've been using the New International Version. That's what we have up here. But for this one, for verses um, 26 and 27, I, I want to read to you from the New Revised Standards Version, which I think has a little pinch of clarity that I like. Be angry, but do not sin. Be angry. Ooh, I like that. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not make room for the devil. This is, this, this is giving us permission to be angry, but we can't just do anything we want out of our anger. We talked about that last week. We can't just rage or abuse or misuse people in our anger. Anger needs to be slow and prayerful. Here we, we see this dimension of anger danger. It says, uh, don't let the sun go down on it. Don't let your anger fade away without getting things resolved. Well, why is it a problem? Why, is it not, why can't I just, like, let it go? Be, be pleasant. Be nice. Well, because it gives the enemy, it gives the devil a foothold. Things like resentment and gossip, lying to cover up your true feelings, allowing injustice to continue. Those things can take a foothold. When I was a kid, my grandparents had this sign in their guest room. And it said, don't go to bed angry, stay up and fight. 
Now, friends, I know that the guest room is where weird things go to die, but just let it go. Just let it out of your house. You actually don't want your guests to stay up and fight when you're in their house. That would really be terrible. So that was what I saw when I was a kid falling asleep, along with my grandma's super cool lava lamp. Um, <laughs> but anyway, okay, so don't go to bed angry. Stay up and fight. I mean, it's catchy. I wouldn't want it in my home. It's catchy, but it's actually not quite an accurate interpretation of this verse. Some scholars think that this verse here in Ephesians is a reference to Psalm 4.4. And Psalm 4.4 says this, in your anger do not sin. When you were on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. This psalm is telling us that it's okay to be alone and silent and prayerful before reacting or speaking in anger. And often in the midst of a busy life, that time is in bed. Now, for some personality types, hashing it out before bed is life-giving. If you can address the conflict right then and there prayerfully, great. And if that schedule also works for the person that you are having conflict with, okay, cool. I mean, right? No need to, no need to let it simmer. Uh, but, but this isn't a command that during the summer you have until 9.30 p.m. if you live in northern Virginia, but during winter you better hash it out before 4.30 or you're sinning. It's not about the literal sun setting. It's about the idea that sometimes we can just shove our anger in so we lose the motivation to actually speak truth. But the problem with that is that just like the sun comes up again, those issues are going to come back up again. But now, instead of it being one issue, it's a lot more complicated. It's now five issues, the other four times you didn't say anything. Or maybe it's the other 49 times you didn't say anything. Or maybe it's the last five years you didn't say anything. And what you've shoved down is now a blazing fire that's a lot harder to deal with. So we're going to move forward. We're going to skip 20, verse 28, but we're going to come back to it in a minute. But I want us to go to verse 29 next. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. Okay, so I think one little thing in here for if you're the stay up and fight kind of people, make sure, make sure that that is also for the benefit of the other person and not just you. Because sometimes, for those of us that are like, I just want to sleep peacefully, let me word vomit on you. It's, uh, I mean, I, it's understandable, but that's missing, missing the point of what's going on here. That's not actually super, super God-honoring and honoring of the other person also made in God's image. I also want to say about this verse that for our, our folks who have kind of the blazing bright anger, you know this, right? You know this. You're probably often trying to work on taming your tongue and using words that build others up instead of insulting them or tearing them down. But this verse also speaks to the slow burn folks. Because what can happen with the slow burn folks is sometimes this turns into gossip. You have the right words to say, but you're saying them to the wrong person. You're venting, and then you kind of have like simmered out, chilled out about it, but the other person doesn't actually know that something is wrong, so they can't be a participant in fixing it. Or maybe you don't have the right words to say, so you're saying the wrong words to the wrong person, and then it's just stirring up trouble and misunderstandings and giving the devil that foothold. Or going back to Centralia, the smoke and the, the fumes, they, they well up from the ground, but not at the source of the fire. Right? I watched one YouTube video. Right underneath Centralia, it's out, but in the surrounding land, uh, there's this guy going out with his little thermal gun, and he's like finding these, these test tubes that they had put in the ground, and he's showing, oh, it's still 120 here, right? So now we're out in the woods, and you know the fire is burning under the ground there. Well, that is what happens 
when we don't deal with our, our anger is, is then it, it comes out with other people or in other times that have nothing to do with the thing you're really angry about. But for whatever reason, it's easier to steam about this over here than the real issue. Verses 30 through 32, they call those who are Christ followers to remember that we serve a higher power with our lives, both our, with visible things like our actions and words, but also our inner lives and the feelings we, we keep inside or let smoke under the surface. So with our anger, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Wow, that little phrase there is, ooh, that's a powerful phrase. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. It means don't disappoint or let the, the Holy Spirit down. Don't do the right thing. But friends, we don't need to be scared by that verse. Why? Because if you're following Jesus Christ, you have the power of the Holy Spirit in you who is the change agent who will help you and empower you to make these changes. You can do the right thing when you have the power of the Lord with you. Not perfectly, not going to nail it every time. But you can establish a pattern of moving forward. Of using anger in the right ways when you have the Holy Spirit in you. So if we keep going with these verses, it says, Cast off bitterness, rage, anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Okay, now... Rage and brawling, those are the visible things, right? Those are the very visible anger, fire kinds of things. So yes, cast those off, as we talked about last week, cast those off. But our slow-burning anger folks aren't off the hook. Cast off bitterness, which is what happens when we stuff things down rather than appropriately addressing conflict or the things that make us angry. That word brawling that's there, that can also be translated as wrangling. And wrangling makes me think of the, the slow burn problems that come of manipulation rather than direct confrontation. When someone really, really wants to avoid anger or conflict, sometimes we get into these patterns of doing a whole lot of hustle and bustle around the issue, a whole lot of back and forth with someone else, maybe triangulation with a third person to try to deal with the issue and keep the real conflict from playing out. And you know, not all things that make us angry or righteous anger or, or worth the fight there's plenty of, of small things to just let go. And we need wisdom to know the difference. But there definitely are things in life that are worth getting angry about. That are worth addressing head on rather than wrangling them. And that brings us back to verse 28. It's, it's kind of this strange tone change that happens in this verse. This is why I wanted us to look at it separately. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in needs. It seems strange in our context. Where did that come from? But let's put ourselves in the context of first century. Let's put ourselves in, the, in the, this setting where to hear teaching or to hear proclamations of law or wisdom, you would come to a town square or a city center you would, or the forum where these things are being given verbally. And there's a way that you give these speeches so that they're respected. And one of the things that needed to happen culturally in these speeches is that you would address what the individual needed to do. But you also had to address it to the whole. What is good for us as a people. That's how you would make a good case for a moral argument. And the great thing is that that actually ties into something we say around here a lot. A life of faith isn't just about me. It is also about we. We're going to do it again because it's been a while since we've said it and we have some new folks too. A life of faith isn't just about me. It is also about we. That's right. And today so far we've talked a lot about the personal when it comes to our slow burn under the surface anger, which makes sense because a lot of us, including me, have things 
that make us angry, as we should, or things that make us sad. It's part of the human experience. But I also want us to just talk about some other centered things, some we things that should make us angry that, that this verse touches on a little bit, that our story of Jesus in the temple, if you were here last week, alluded to as well. Things that should make us angry are injustice and poverty, hunger and abuse, situations that cause people to feel like they need to steal as their way forward. Those things should make us angry. Last week, our, our story of Jesus, he, Jesus was angry over spiritual abuse, over injustice, over powerful people making gain off impoverished folks who were just trying to do the right thing, live the right way, and bring their sacrifice to the temple. These things are worth getting angry about. But these things are also really big. And we may be tempted to look away in helplessness, denial, or apathy. We may feel like these things are someone else's problem or that our anger or action can't actually do anything. So we dull our anger, we stuff it down, or we just look away. But there's anger danger in that. We talked about personally, but there's anger danger in that as a we as well because it allows the enemy to flourish. It allows the devil to take a foothold rather than us being change agents for the kingdom of God. That we as a church, body of Christ, I mean like big C church, like all Christians, all people who are following Jesus Christ are called to be, to show, live out, usher in the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God. So friends, we all know people that burn too hot on some of these issues. We all know people that burn too cool. Maybe we feel or find ourselves on one of those spectrum, one of those ends as well. But it's kind of like the three little bears. There's the too hot, there's the too cold, and then there's the baby bear that comes in and everything's just right. In our lives, living after Jesus Christ, we want to work towards that middle way. And ultimately, we want to be like verse 32, which was the final verse of the passage we read today. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. Some of us have the belief that stuffing things down or not naming hard truths is kind. But the truth is that clear is kind. Honest is kind. Allowing others to be clued in so they can, if, if they're willing to participate, find a middle ground with us or work towards forgiveness is kind. In our healthy expressions of anger, be kind, be compassionate. Move forward to being able to forgive rather than holding a grudge. Because when we don't stuff it down, that's when we can move to forgiveness. When we don't stuff it down, that's when we can move towards freedom. When we don't stuff it down, that's where we can move towards kingdom of God, principles, and change that is widespread. So I really struggled today. How do I wrap this message up? Because it, it's big. This is big, huge stuff that we can't solve in a day or even a year. What's the call to life change in all this? Well, I'm going to name some, some big things, okay? One, face your anger. Two, act on justice. Three, be angry about the things that really matter. And four, let honest communication, even with conflict, draw you forward in Christ's love. But those are not easily solved, we can't just say, I really like number one. I'm going to do that right now. Face your anger. Okay, let me turn it on. That's not a reality of how our, our brains and our bodies and our relationships work. So I will say one step, if you know me, something I often say is that we only have to take the one next right step that the Holy Spirit is calling us to. So one right step in this could be that if you feel like anger isn't allowed, if you feel like no feelings come out of you, 
That, that would be something to look into. That would be something to, to talk to someone about. Even a, a professional, a trusted friend. Have that first conversation about this. The other thing I want to say is that for some of us, we're holding on to an old helplessness from another season of life. For others of us, we find ourselves in denial or apathy, and, and so we're not utilizing anger, right? There's a too much anger. There's a too little. We want to utilize anger, utilize anger in a way that's life-giving, kingdom uplifting, Maybe for some folks that means reading a book about anger. There's one called Good and Angry that looks fabulous. There's actually two books called that. One is like when you're really angry at like your kids. That's a good one. And the other one is about looking at anger holistically and in all of the ways that tie into some of the things I've talked about today. Something else you can do is to try an anger experiment when you feel something and you feel prayed up on it, you feel the nudge of the Holy Spirit, then say something. Not every time, but just experiment with it. Try it once and see what happens. And you know what's going to happen? You're not going to do it perfectly. The other person isn't going to respond perfectly. Angels aren't going to sing and it's going to be kumbaya peaceful. But it's going to break something open. And it's going to get that fire and smoke that's under the surface, starting to release, starting to be at the right spot so that you can move forward. But just think of it as an experiment, something to try with the power of the Holy Spirit behind you and guiding you. Now, when I was young, I had a saying. I said, I don't get mad, I get sad. That saying has red flags all over it. That's the saying of someone who feels trapped in helplessness, where you're emotionally shut down. But Jesus had a better path for me, and Jesus has a better path for you. Jesus Christ died on the cross. Jesus Christ lived and loved and exists eternally for the sake of our freedom so we don't have to be imprisoned by anger, by resentment, by emotion, by having too much anger or too little anger, but that we may have life and life abundantly. So friends, today, let's pray. Let's pray for the, for the Lord to meet us wherever we are on this spectrum of anger and to empower us into doing it God's good and holy way. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for the gift of your holy scripture, that in it there are the accounts of people who are imperfect and situations that are messy and families that are messed up people who just totally, totally blow it. Because that's our stories, God. We can find ourselves in our situations, in our broken hearts, or our anger, or our rage, or our helplessness, or our apathy, or our denial, or, or any of the, the messy, complicated things, Lord, that we feel or experience. We can find ourselves in that, and we can know that we are still beloved. We are made in your image, that you care for us, that you have the gift of the Holy Spirit for us to help us to take that one right next step forward towards freedom and wholeness and a life of abundance and goodness, Lord. It's kind of funny to think about a fairy tale of a too hot or a too cold, but God, there's something about that just right. There's something about that way of knowing that you will guide us and grow us as we pursue sanctification in you, God. We continue to live for you and toward your holy way. It gives me hope, Lord. 
And I hope that it gives hope to each person here, each person watching online live with us, each person watching or listening in a replay, Lord. Help us to have that wisdom when it comes to anger, danger, wherever we fall on the spectrum, from it burning hot to feeling like we just don't even have it. To know the one step you're calling us to today, the one experiment we should try this week, Lord, to harness the God-given feelings and mind that you have given us and personality that you've given us, Lord, for your good and your glory so that many may know you, so that your kingdom come, even now, that your will be done today through us for your glory. In your name we pray, amen.
today as those who call this place home bring their tithes, their offerings, Lord, be it through our giving box or online or through mail. God, we just ask that you take uh, what is given, multiply it for your kingdom purposes, Lord, and equip this body of Christ to be change agents for your kingdom and your good. Amen.
to welcome Don Robbins, our youth director for our benediction today. Good morning, church. For today's benediction, I'd like to pray with you all before we walk out into the world today and remember as Pastor Pam has preached and has talked to us and taught us. Be slow to speak. Be quick to listen. Be slow to anger. Father God, thank you for this blessed day. Thank you for this time to be in your sanctuary. Thank you, Lord for being with each, each and every one of us, no matter where you find us, no matter where we wander. You are there to comfort us, to love us, to help us find peace and hope in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Go with us all today that we may lift up your light unto the world and may shine forth the light of Christ Jesus by being quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. In your holy name we pray, amen. amen. Go out, have a wonderful week. <laughs> Enjoy the spirit of the Lord and shine forth that glowing light within you. God bless you all. <laughs>